Well, good afternoon and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to this virtual meeting of Rotary District 6150. I'm Matt Weeks. I'm going to be your host and moderator today. I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Jonesboro. Now, before our, I introduce our district governor, I want to walk you through how you can ask our guest speaker a question today. We're going to have plenty of time for questions, so please ask. Here's how. First, you're probably watching on either Facebook Live or YouTube TV, so uh, please take a moment and like the Rotary District 6150 Facebook page and subscribe to the Rotary District 6150 YouTube channel. If you're watching on the Facebook Live video feed or on the Rotary District 6150 YouTube channel, you can ask a question uh, in the chat or comment window on either live feed. We're going to select a few questions today relevant to the speaker's discussion. As I introduce our district governor, I want to take a moment and say thank you. This virtual district meeting is his idea. It's important that we find ways to stay connected, stay informed, and stay safe. It fits into the Rotary. So thank you, District Governor, for your leadership during these trying times. Now, let me introduce our District Governor. Uh, George is a member of the Rotary Club of Lawrence County. His background is in medicine, helping lead a number of hospitals and facilities in North Central Arkansas and Northeast Arkansas. Polio eradication is one of his passions, having had two relatives survive the disease. George and his wife, Linda, have been married for 45 years. He and Linda have three grown children. George is now retired, which uh, we assume gives him more time for things like the Rotary Club. So please welcome Rotary District 6150 Governor George Frey. George? Thanks, Hatton, for the introduction. And I want to thank you for being with us today for this special Rotary District 6150 webinar. Our presenter today is Dr. Jennifer Dillahay, state epidemiologist with the Arkansas Department of Health. But I want to pause for a moment to recognize the clubs that continue to meet using technology, such as Zoom and GoToMeeting, and those clubs that are being an example in their communities by being involved in meaningful projects that make things better during these difficult times. After all, we are living with a norm that is unlike anything in our lifetime. But we will be stronger and better when this is over. Please be safe and healthy in all activities. Dr. Dillahay is a fellow Rotarian, a member of the West Little Rock Rotary Club. She became a Rotarian in April 2011 and has come to understand what Rotary means to her personally and professionally. And she is here to share with us an issue that she has become deeply involved in. She has worked at the Arkansas Department of Health since 2001, where she has played several roles over the years. In March 2020, Dr. Dillahay was named the state epidemiologist for Arkansas. This is in addition to her role as medical director for immunizations since November of 2013 and the medical director for outbreak response since August 2019. Her charge in the role of state epidemiologist is to provide leadership and guidance for addressing Arkansas's most pressing infectious diseases, including COVID-19. She is also charged with improving Arkansas's immunization rates, particularly among adults. She is uniquely qualified for that role as a physician with specialty training in internal medicine and subspecialty training in infectious diseases and in geriatric medicine. Her topic today will be an update on the COVID-19 pandemic and what it means for Rotarians in Arkansas. Please join me and welcoming Dr. Jennifer Dillahay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about COVID-19 with the Rotarians in our district. Um, so I'm going to start by trying to share my screen. So I'm gonna see if I can make this work. Okay, so what I have shared here is a website that's put out by Johns Hopkins University, and it is a world map and the current status of COVID-19 uh, on Earth. So we can see that we've had a total of 2,682 cases or more. 
and we've had over 187,000 deaths. Now I would like to share um, something from the U.S. So here you see a map of the states in the U.S. We've had COVID-19 cases in all 50 states. And in Arkansas, we're a little bit on the lighter side. We have not had as many cases as some of our neighboring states have had. Um, and so now I'm going to switch to the um, health department's website um, to provide you with an update. Let's see if we can pull that up. So this is a map of Arkansas. And uh, as of uh, today, we have 2,465 cases of COVID-19 in Arkansas. Our first case was reported on March 11th. So we've had an increase over time. We've had 44, 45 deaths to date. Um, but we've had over... Uh, almost 34,000 people tested. And um, fortunately, most of those people are negative. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and just uh, talk to you about what does this mean for us? So we have a situation in the United States where uh, states, including Arkansas, have taken steps to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And now we're in a situation where the spread in Arkansas has uh, lessened. We have kind of a flat um, curve. So people are talking about a peak. When will it peak? Well, right now, our number of cases is so flat that it's kind of hard to tell where the peak will be but we believe what will begin to decline in the near future. So um, that raises the question about what do we do now to begin to open up what happens in our state? Do we open businesses? Do we uh, open restaurants? There's lots of questions like that about how is it too soon? What can we do to protect ourselves even after this happens? So I want to emphasize to people that no matter whether a business opens or not, or we go back to work or not, there are some things that are going to be very important for all of us in Arkansas to keep doing. And that includes um, uh, physical distancing, you know, so uh, we will want to keep a distance from people, uh, both uh, as our personal uh, decisions in terms of interacting with people in public. But we will also, when it comes time to open businesses or schools, we will need to open them in such a way that employees, customers, students can maintain physical distance. In addition, we will need to continue doing things such as wearing face masks in public, especially in situations where it is difficult to maintain those social distances. And then uh, there's going to be a need for us to all participate in some screening. Uh, so whether we enter a store that does screening, asking people about their symptoms, or taking their temperature and not allowing them to enter if they're sick. Many businesses are doing this for their employees or people who come in to enter the business for one reason or another. Those are also going to be important for us to continue doing. And then um, we, and people are asking, well, how long will we need to keep doing this? I mean, it's tiresome to people. They don't want to curtail their activities. But this is going to have to be for the long haul. It's going to be needed until the majority of people in the community are immune to COVID-19. And that is unlikely to happen until we get a vaccine. And the vaccine is likely a year or more away. It could be even a year and a half away. So we need to think about this in the long term. 
So uh, people have struggled with this. And so I want to tell a little story. I mentioned this story to my, um, my own Rotary Club, the West Little Rock Motory Club. And it's the, what I call the Stockdale Paradox. So it's named after James Stockdale, who was the highest ranking naval officer in captivity in Hanoi during the Vietnam War. He was in prison there in captivity for seven years. When he uh, was finally released, he was interviewed and asked what made a difference for his ability to survive. And were there other people who didn't do as well that he could speak about? And he said that the people who did the most poorly were the optimists. And by that, he meant the people who said, okay, we're going to get out at Christmas time. And then Christmas would come and go and they weren't out. And then they would say, okay, we're going to get out at Easter. And then Easter would come and go and they weren't out. And they would be devastated and crushed by this. But uh, Admiral Stockdale's approach was one of unwavering belief that he would make it through but he was extremely realistic. He knew it would be hard. He knew he would be tortured again. He knew that there would be times of difficulty and misery for him, but he never wavered in his belief that he would prevail, even though things were difficult and sometimes for us unimaginably difficult. So that's what I call the Stockdale paradox. It comes from Jim Collins' book. It's a business book, Good to Great. And I think this is an important approach for us as Rotarians, that we can encourage those in our clubs, as business leaders in our communities. We can encourage people to stay the course, to not let up, and know that in the end, we will prevail, but we cannot afford to let off yet just because we're tired of the situation. I also wanted to talk a little bit about what we as Rotarians could do. And there's two uh, different, actually I have three different suggestions. One is, you know, Rotarians are so often the business leaders in their communities. So I'm calling on Rotarians in Arkansas to be role models for this type of behavior, for how they set up the um, physical environment of their businesses, that they structure things so that there is social distancing and that when people enter their business, they are safe and less likely to be exposed to the uh, COVID-19 virus. And it also means providing a safe place for their employees to come to work. And again, I'm talking about physical distancing, wearing face masks, or some people call them face coverings because they don't have to be a medical mask, it can be a cloth covering. And uh, in screening employees or the people they interact with who come into their buildings. The other thing is that, uh, as we're all aware, this pandemic has imposed a great deal of hardship, especially economic hardship on people. And many of the food banks in our communities are struggling because people do not have the income that they once had. And many people already were living paycheck to paycheck and they will need to some assistance just having their basic needs met. So I encourage Rotary Clubs around the state to get involved in their local food banks or some of the state efforts in the Arkansas um, uh, Hunger Relief Alliance and the, our food bank. And then the other thing I want to talk about is I want to encourage all of the Rotary Clubs in our district to consider having a program on how to cope during this pandemic the mental health aspects of this. So I'm going to try to share one more screen um, and 
uh, here. And um, so the health department has put on our website um, various, um, there we are, various um, uh, resources for people who are struggling with the mental health part of uh, the COVID pandemic. So I would like to encourage you to use this resource. There are other resources out there that you may be aware of, but this is a time of great stress for people. We need people to understand what their resources are, but also there's many Rotarians who are doing well and they can share with others what they are doing that is working and give other people ideas. I think this is going to be an important topic for discussion in our Rotary Clubs. So uh, with that, I am going to um, stop and I'm going to go ahead and let people ask questions if they have any. Absolutely, and uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, they're either on Facebook Live or YouTube. Um, just ask in the comments, and uh, we will um, ask uh, Dr. Dillahay. She is the uh, infectious disease specialist for the state of Arkansas, so this is your opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, and and I'll, I'll get things started. You know, um, word came out earlier this week that it uh, looks like the first case in the country may have been in California back in early February. Um, on the state level here in Arkansas, are we seeing any um, any indication that this may have been here longer than, than we first suspected? Well, uh, we think that our first identified case was uh, reported to us on March the 11th. And we think there were likely other cases prior to that time. It was very difficult to tell because at that point in time, the only way to get testing was, of course, uh, to send the test sample to the CDC. Now the health department can test as well as many hospitals and uh, clinics around the state. So we have uh, a feeling that it may have been here, but we couldn't prove it. Um, and then also testing, let me just add, is going to be really important for us as we uh, decrease our rates in the state. We want to keep them low. So it's going to be very important to have quick testing available for suspected cases so that if someone is diagnosed, they can immediately be isolated either at home or if they're sick enough in the hospital. And then they can be interviewed regarding what would have been their infectious period. And then we can track where they were. Did they go to work? What kind of activities did they engage in? And then we can determine who would have been exposed to that person and identify all their close contacts because then those people would need to be in quarantine. We know that the incubation period is about 14 days at the most. More commonly, it's about five days, but it could be up to 14 days. And so we ask those people to be quarantined, to uh, remove themselves from being out in public, to stay at home, so that if they do develop illness, they won't expose additional people. So the testing is gonna be really key because if they do have symptoms, well, then we want them tested right away too. So that turnaround is gonna be really important. We have greater uh, capacity to do that now in Arkansas than we have before. And that's a very hopeful sign that we'll be able to keep the uh, rates of COVID-19 low while we open up businesses and activities in Arkansas. If we couldn't keep those rates low, we would have to pull back on some of those activities and uh, close them off again. And we don't want to do that. So having good testing capability in Arkansas is going to be really important. Getting to get some good questions in here, uh, Doctor. Here's from uh, Stephen Maxwell. Do you have any idea about the number of folks that might have recovered without ever having any symptoms? Well, uh, that is a good question. We, uh, of course, if they didn't have any symptoms, they might not have been tested. So we wouldn't know about them as being a case. There are some people who don't have symptoms and they're tested because they're a contact to a, situ a case that we're investigating. Um, we don't know yet, but we hope to find out. Um, 
there's a lot we don't know yet about COVID-19 because it's a new disease. And so the CDC has worked on a test to test antibodies. So right now, uh, the test to diagnose COVID-19 is what's called a PCR. It's a polymerase chain reaction. And it looks for the genetic material of the virus. It shows that the virus is physically present. But uh, after people recover, of course, the virus is not there anymore, but people develop some antibodies to the virus. And you can test those antibodies uh, by drawing blood and see who has reacted to that virus in the past. So if you do that in a systematic way, you can tell what proportion of the um, population actually had COVID-19 in the past. And some of those people may very well test positive on those antibody tests, but they, they didn't know they had it or they thought they had a cold or something else. And uh, so those are gonna be very useful in understanding the spread of the disease in Arkansas. Right now, those antibody tests uh, don't become positive until after a person is getting well. So it's not useful in making a decision right now. Does this person have it? Do they need to be isolated? The other thing that we need to keep in mind is some of those antibody tests can cross-react with other human coronaviruses. There's about four human coronaviruses that are uh, common causes of the common cold. About 30% of the cases of common cold are by other human coronavirus. So sometimes the antibodies tests can pick up on those too, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So it has to be re really good antibody tests. And we have to be careful about what test we use. Uh, but, and then it's going to be important to know about who's had immunity, because when we want to test um, vaccines, you want to test them against someone who's not immune, right? Because if they're already immune, you might think the vaccine worked for them, but it really didn't. They were already immune. So you have to use those antibody tests in the situations where you're doing the studies on um, the development of vaccines. We're getting several questions in here on um, uh, reopening and uh, the May 4th um, date that the governor has indicated. Here's uh, this kind of uh, encapsulates everything. James and Nichols, the governor indicated possibly lifting restrictions on smaller venue gatherings beginning May 4th. What are your thoughts on larger gatherings like churches, movie houses, et cetera? Well, those are also being looked at. We don't know yet what the governor will decide to do. But if we do open those, no matter at what point, whether it's May 4th or later on, we will need to do things differently. So uh, one possibility is in an auditorium, for example, you can mark off certain seats so people spread out when they're sitting together, when they're all in that same area. You can ask them to wear masks. You can do other things that would reduce the chance that you would have spread of COVID-19 in that environment. But I know that the governor is looking at those things, but I don't, I'm not aware of any decision he's made at this point. Here's one from um, former district governor, John Deacon. Uh, less than 50% of grocery store customers are wearing masks and even less a percentage of that in em of employees. How do we increase the mask usage in, in Arkansas, especially those serving in the public? Well, that's an excellent question. And that has to do with the leadership in Rotarians. Rotarians need to be going to the business leaders and asking them to put in such policies that their employees wear masks. And we're really pleased to uh, note that Walmart just this week announced that their associates are going to be wearing masks. So it could be that it will be needed for certain uh, venues to require their customers if they're going to enter the store to come in. My son who lives in another state was at the grocery store and they have a person hand you the cart after they've wiped it down. You have to wear a mask to get in the store and you wait in line that's spaced out and only a certain number of people enter the store. And so you enter after you've waited in line uh, when someone else exits the store. 
And there are things like that that we could do in Arkansas, but that is a leadership issue of the business leaders. And Rotarians have a role that they can play to encourage other business leaders in their communities to put such policies into place and they can model it with their own businesses. You know, uh, we're getting a lot of questions in here. This one kind of bounces off what we were just talking about, the uh, discussion on the next number of people gathering that will be acceptable, thinking rotary meetings as we move through phases of this long journey, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, thanks you for your leadership and, and dedication. So what is it, uh, 10 people now? What do you think the next number would be? And when do you think we, we might be able to open up things a little bit? Well, I don't know what the next number will be. I haven't seen that. I have seen 50 as in some of the guides, but I don't know if that's what the governor will choose. But on the other hand, you know, even 50 may be too many if the space is too small. So we have to give thought about that physical distancing, about not having people crowded together. That is something that we're not going to be able to do uh, if we wish to maintain our rates low. So it's not just the numbers, it's going to be the physical space and what allows for that kind of physical distancing. Here's another good question uh, from uh, Scott Trouder. Do the guidelines for opening the economy consider underlying conditions in rural counties where less dense populations is a protection, but also tend to be older, sicker, et cetera? You know, that's a really uh, important balance there because we do want to protect our older citizens as well as those people who have chronic health conditions no matter their age. So uh, some of the things that communities do can be at a community level. So businesses can still allow uh, people who are more vulnerable to have certain shopping times, for example, or communities can put into place services that would support these people uh, in meeting their needs, shopping errands and so forth to reduce their vulnerability. We know that there are communities in Arkansas where there is likely not much spread of COVID-19 and uh, that's reassuring to know UMS has done some community-based clinics, I understand, testing for COVID-19 and didn't find much. So that's hopeful, but we want to keep it that way. And so that is, uh, and they're often rural communities where you don't have a lot of transit in and out, in and out. On the other hand, we've had rural communities such as in Claiborne County, where we had a tremendous amount of transmission within one social network uh, related to a church. So it's going to take everybody working together in the community. And this is a, I think this uh, pandemic has illustrated almost more than anything I can remember in recent years, how key it is to assure the safety of everyone for any one person to be safe. So no one is safe unless we're all safe. And that is, I think, one of the keys to Rotary Club's involvement in their communities is ensuring that everyone is safe, uh, not just certain groups or people uh, who um, like the elderly or people with um, chronic conditions, they can't stay home forever. They need social interaction just as much as anyone else does. So to keep them safe, we have to keep the rest of the community safe. Here's another uh, really good question that plays off of uh, something the CDC director had earlier this week, Floyd. And Floyd, I would try to pronounce your last name, but I'd totally butcher it. Um, seems to be a great deal of conversation about a second and or a third wave. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. So um, I think the uh, best documented experience of pandemic that we have in our historical memory is the 1918 influenza pandemic and it had three waves it had an initial wave that people did fairly well and then uh sadly on armistice day in november 11th the restrictions were removed people partied in the streets they were so happy for world war one to be over and then we had an even bigger spike after that 
Um, I don't know if that will happen with regard to COVID, but it could. And that is one of the things that is uh, going to be important for us to monitor carefully. Um, there's some thought that perhaps uh, COVID-19 is affected by seasons. Does it seasonal like the flu, for example? But we see that it's spreading worldwide, even in the tropics. So temperature doesn't seem to make a difference. But right now, children are not in school and children are just really um, efficient spreaders of respiratory viruses. So we will need to watch in the fall to see if schools start. I'm not saying they will, but if they do, uh, will we see an uptick? Of course, that's oftentimes when we see the flu spreading is when school's in session. It kind of tends to go away in the summer when school's not in session. So we will have to watch and monitor for possible additional waves of this uh, virus. It, we could continue to see waves uh, of the virus until we have a large level of immunity for this disease or until we have an effective vaccine. So uh, I would say that an additional wave is possible and we must protect against it by maintaining very strict um, use of physical distancing, masks and hand hygiene, as well as cleaning the environment. Next question come, uh, comes from Charles Harris. Charles, uh, his question, uh, he sounds like a bit of a statistician, but it's a very important one. About 1% of Arkansas's population has been tested. Is there a certain percentage of those tested uh, needed to have a valid sample base for assessing the status of where we really are in flattening the curve? Well, that is a very important uh, question. So, um, we do look at the percentages of positive tests. Um, and the ones that we run at the health department, we're running tests on the highest risk people. So we would expect the proportion of our tests to be, uh, have a higher rate of positivity. Um, tests out in the community when you're trying to assess community spread is different. And we have not had, in my opinion, sufficient, um, uh, testing available on a routine basis around the state to really get an overall picture. We do have a sense of whether it's present in the community or not, uh, but how many cases there are in some cases, is, in some instances of community is not really clear. And we are now with our increased capacity just in the last week or two and in the next few weeks, we'll have even more uh, capacity for testing to really look at sampling the community, uh, testing uh, not just people who have symptoms, which we've emphasized so far, because those people will be the ones most likely to have a positive test, but there will be some asymptomatic people. So if we can uh, expand testing and make it more widely available and do it in a, a systematic way, then we can have a better assessment. And we will be working with the CDC and our own epidemiologists to determine where would be appropriate to test and what kinds of numbers would need to uh, be tested in order to get a valid, realistic assessment of the current situation in Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Dillahay uh, with the state of Arkansas joining us. And uh, next question comes from Ida Patton. Many people have postponed health appointments. How will we know when it's safe to return to the doctor for checkups? Well, that's a very good question. A lot of people have postponed their appointments, their dental uh, cleanings and so forth. So uh, the health department is working with the governor to assess those situations with input from uh, clinicians and uh, dentists and others to make a determination about what is the safest approach? So right now, of course, there's uh, many opportunities for telehealth appointments, which is a good way to uh, get assessed and get the information you need and uh, address some clinical problems. So working with your healthcare provider is gonna be one of the most important things. And 
the uh, clinics in Arkansas have been very responsive in terms of setting up their clinic flow to minimize the possibility of transmission. We now have um, better supplies in our state of what we call PPE, personal protective equipment. So clinics now have better access to the kinds of things that they need to protect themselves, such as uh, masks or gowns or gloves. Those are going to be important. And so uh, it's going to be working in connection with their individual clinics and the clinics will need to know what is the spread in their community. And then working with um, the health department and um, other um, like the CDC to understand the guidances about what can be done to minimize the spread. It, we won't be able to do clinic like we did before. We'll have to do it differently, but how can we do it differently that would be best the best way to serve the uh, patients in our state? Tom Trevathan's got a, a really good question. Can you get it more than once? That is an unknown uh, question, uh, answer. So we know from the other human coronaviruses uh, like that cause the common cold, their frequent cause is about 30% of the common cold, that people do not develop lifelong immunity to those viruses. We do not yet know whether that is the case with the virus that causes COVID-19. It's thought that when people first get infected, of course, they will have immunity because they will overcome the infection. But how long does that immunity protect them? Will it wane to a certain point where later they could get it again? And that actually is not known. Um, we are hoping that as uh, the vaccine trials carry out, there's a number of candidate vaccines under development uh, at least 80 around the world. There are at least three right now that I'm aware of that are in clinical trials. It is our hope that these vaccines will actually be able to stimulate the uh, immune response to develop permanent immunity, but that's not known yet either. We see with our flu vaccines or with our pertussis vaccines that people need boosters over time. And it could be that we will need uh, COVID-19 vaccine boosters as well in order to prevent people from getting it again. Dr. Jennifer Dillahay with the Arkansas Department of Health joining us. Brian Riga asks a question, very simple. How are we doing on flattening the curve? I think we're doing pretty good, but we've got to keep it up. This is no time to be letting up on it. And I can tell you that, you know, when you're at the top of a curve, that's not when you stop. You just wait until you're on the other side. But even for us, with this virus and this illness, we can't even stop when we're on the other side and the bottom of that curve because we could have a resurgence. So that's really important. We're doing well. We need to keep it up and we need to go for the long haul. We need to keep the Stockdale paradox in mind so that we can stay focused, know we are going to prevail, but we have not uh, we're not going to be able at all to let up on our personal actions to prevent the spread of this disease. Uh, Nancy asks, um, what are your thoughts on this returning during the 2021 flu season? And that, that I guess that goes yes. into an earlier right. question about coming right. back. Um, yes. but, but the flu has gotten um, kind of been pushed on the back burner. Um, yes. But how is this past season's flu uh, compared to, to other seasons and what does next year look like or, or have you gotten that far ahead? Well, actually I've been thinking about it a little bit, not a whole lot because I'm so focused on COVID-19, but there's a couple of things to keep in mind. When we started doing social distancing in Arkansas and taking in, uh, measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, our flu in Arkansas just dropped. So we could very well help ourselves in the fall and in the winter uh, with the 2021 uh, flu season if we would continue to do those measures, even if COVID-19 went completely away, which it won't, but even without that, 
if we did those same things for the flu, we would have a lot less flu in circulation and a lot fewer flu deaths. I'm just convinced of that. Right. It's going to be also very important for people to get a flu vaccine this next fall. And the reason is, is that you don't want flu and COVID-19 at the same time. And you don't want to confuse the picture. Uh, so we will be working to make sure that we have really good vaccination rates in the fall with the new um, round of flu vaccines that will be coming out. That's going to be really important for us to protect everyone. And, you know, um, one thing that just I've been thinking about lately is that, you know, we have become very accepting of having a lot of flu and flu deaths in Arkansas. And you can't really compare flu and COVID-19 in terms of illness. COVID-19 is overall much more deadlier, but it's spread the same way. And if we can prevent it the same way, then let's do it. Absolutely. Here's one that uh, is close to home for me. Um, can children use outdoor playground equipment when other children are not present? And I assume the question is at a, a public playground. Well, it depends on the situation in the city. So uh, we know that the COVID-19 virus can survive on stainless steel and non porous uh, surfaces for about three days. So one would have to clean the equipment if other children that possibly could have had COVID-19 had previously played on that equipment. It's difficult uh, for, uh, of course, children uh, can't really wear masks the way that uh, adults can, and children under two should not wear masks. So uh, it's hard to help prevent that spread when young children are playing in together. Uh, there is no, to my point of view, reason why they couldn't if the equipment was clean. But when it's in a public setting, then it makes it harder for other children also to not play on it and to keep it uh, um, private, so to speak. Next question from uh, Stuart Shaw. Do the number of tests include people that are in prison or have been tested multiple times? So um, the number of total uh, positive cases in Arkansas does include people who are in prison. And some of you may be aware we're having a very large outbreak in our maximum security prison in Cummins. And we are working really hard to, with the Department of Corrections, as well as the warden there to bring that uh, under control. Our totals do include those. Um, we, uh, if we have a positive case, if they receive an additional test, we don't count them twice. Um, so we, our tests, our cases should be unique individuals, not a sent one person more than once. Um, I have been asked if the prisons include the total are included in the total and they are. But I want people to understand that when we're trying to assess community spread, we are taking the cases in the prison out so we could look and see uh, how much community spread there is because you wouldn't want to make a decision based on say opening restaurants based on what's happening in Cummins that that wouldn't be uh, appropriate. But so we are splitting them out on in some ways in order to look at what's happening in communities to assess the spread. But in terms of the overall total, all positive cases are in that total, no matter where they are in Arkansas. All right, we're gonna take two more questions. Um, let's see, the first one uh, comes from uh, Karen. When should we get our flu shot for the 2020 flu season? So um, that uh, shot is generally available at the end of August in some pharmacies. I like to encourage people to get it by the end of October. Uh, we usually 
start seeing flu pick up in Arkansas. Sometimes it's a little early. It could be in November, December. And then we also um, will have uh, sometimes a peak after Christmas. But uh, we want people to be have the immunity before they're exposed to the flu. It takes about two weeks for the immune system to respond to the vaccine with the desired immunity. So we strongly encourage people to get uh, vaccinated by the end of October, if not before. All right. Last question comes from uh, Sarah Spencer. Are all tests for the virus and for antibodies currently free of charge to all in Arkansas? Well, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I have not paid attention to the billing. The billing. Uh, we are not encouraging antibody tests right now in Arkansas. So it's really the testing. And testing will not be denied to people for their inability to pay. But I understand that insurances are covering it. And there are uh, there's funding available for uh, the health department and other places to provide testing so that people uh, will not have to pay. So there's a lot of it that is being free of charge. I can't say if it's all free of charge. I wouldn't, I don't think it is. Gotcha. Well, Dr. Jennifer Dillahay, the uh, state epidemiologist for the state of Arkansas and fellow Rotarian, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I'm just really glad to have had this opportunity and maybe I could do a update if y'all want me to in the future. I would love to be able to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, at this time, we're going to turn things over to uh, District Governor George Frey. George? This concludes our program today. And I want to thank our presenter, Dr. Dillahay, Hatton Weeks, the moderator, Sam Hubblestein, producer, and for you for being a part of this live webcast. As we plan future programs, uh, we would welcome your comments and, rep and recommendations. Uh, we encourage you to do this and be a part of... Uh, future planning. Thank you for being a part today.